the harbor. Welcome, welcome to the evening show with Jackie Brambles. If you're new to the show, you are in for a treat tonight because for this evening's hour of great conversation and musical memories, we are going to be kept in line by a man whose no-nonsense approach to rock and roll has earned him the rank of captain. And I do say that somewhat ironically. Uh, that track, Glad It's All Over, got to number six in 1984 for tonight's special guest for The Great Conversation. He is a founder member of the punk group The Damned and a solo artist in his own balmy right. Welcome to the one and only Captain Sensible. Hello, Jackie. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. I'm, I've um, got your paperwork in front of me with the uh, questions and stuff. You've done your homework? I, well, I, like I, a sensible I, lad. I gave it a try, uh, but it's <laughs> a bit of paper's covered with scrawls, and I, I, so I might bumble my, my way through this. Um. That's okay. I do that every night. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, let's start off in the, in the current day. You are currently, you're on tour at the moment, right? Yes, we are, yeah. Yeah. Um, we're, yeah, 43 years into the dodgy old career, they've slung us out on the road again for quite an extensive trip around uh, Europe and Britain and and, and beyond. Uh, yeah, America and then down under. Crikey. The, ma- the new management are certainly cracking the whip. <laughs> well, that's, that's, well, there's obviously a demand. They wouldn't do it if there wasn't any dosh in it, let's face it. Right, a by public demand, <laughs> Captain. <laughs> there you go. So, is this the first time that that, that that you've all played together? The Damned have all played together in how long? We've been uh, kind of a, a going entity for yeah a long, long time now. Um, uh, the the enforced gap was the last two years. I think everyone had to take really. Uh, in, yeah. In which time, um, I think anyone who could play a couple of chords on the guitar knocked up a, a lockdown album. So. Uh, as did we, um, which is called Darkadelic. Yeah, so that, I think that's what we're plugging at the moment. So this was that this was your lockdown album. Were you all sort of doing it in your own houses and and emailing files back and forward and stuff? Yes, uh, yeah, but we did get together for three weeks and uh, we pounded out the tracks, kind of uh, in the you know the the traditional fashion for uh, for bands of our age. Really, I don't know how they make albums anymore, but uh, I think so. Well, you hear, you hear that people in New York might make an album with someone in, I don't know, um, Hamburg and not even meet them. Uh, they send kind of stuff over the internet. But, yeah. but no, we there was five people in a room like, you know, making an unholy din for, uh, for a few weeks <laughs> until, we, until we were happy with it. Um, so, yeah. That's absolutely brilliant. To to what do you to what do you attribute the longevity of the band? Because there's really not that many that have continuously sort of you know made records and gigged together over the years. Albeit it might be a break of a year or two here or there, or a couple of different lineups or whatever. But to continue going that same entity for as long as you have, what do you put it down to? Well, first, like you say, it's the audience because we can't do it without you know people come and watch us play. Uh, so that's that's the first thing. Secondly, I don't know. We, we enjoy it. Um, you stand on a stage with a, you know, a great valve amplifier, you know, cranked up to the max, and it's it's just one of the greatest things ever, you know. And, and that's why so many people, you know, um, buy guitars wherever wherever they go out and do, uh, you know, um, as much gigging as we do. It just it's just a great noise, and it's such fun. And third, the third reason is. For some reason or other, um, our contemporaries, uh, the, the Sex Pistols and the Stranglers, made billions, you know? And the poor old damned, we, we're still kind of, you know, we, we've got to work for a living. So that's why we're still out on the road. One day see a strange little girl look at you. Where are you going? Number seven in 1982 for The Stranglers, Strange Little Girl. Contemporaries of The Damned who are currently on their UK tour. They're going to be in Southampton tomorrow and London at the Alley Pally for a couple of dates Thursday, Friday this week. Then off to the States, Australia and New Zealand. Blimey, that's that's a lot, Captain Sensible. I love travelling. I'd love to go to India and China and places like that. Uh, but, but they haven't discovered us yet. Actually, I heard that the punk was getting um, reasonably popular in Beijing, so I'm, we're awaiting the call. You're off to Beijing next. As, as I say, we're, we're waiting for a 
for them to uh, contact us. <laughs> <laughs> or we kick the bucket. Come on. <laughs> So if you if if it's okay with you then captain if we may um we like to kind of go back to through the mists of time to figure out what the musical influences were along the way um so uh, you you grew up in london didn't you south london yes <laughs> grew up in south, was it, was it a particularly musical household that you had my dad was into like bing crosby and frank sinatra and, and all that old pruning nonsense i mean i did i didn't get it i didn't like it you know in fact yeah until the 60s or, or, or you know, rock and roll, and then the sixties happened. Uh, that kind of sparked my interest a bit more. Do you remember the first record that you would have bought yourself then, as a as a young lad, saving up your pocket money? Yes, well, I was uh, too young to go to the shop and buy it, but um, I asked my mum if she'd possibly go and get me um, "I'm a Moody Guy" by Shane Fenton and the Fentones. Oh, interesting! Uh, Shane Fenton turned into a seventies glam rock megastar. Um, called Alvin Stardust. That's right. I was just about to say that. Yeah, so, uh, was that pre-silver platform boots then, was it? It was, yeah. He was yeah. a, a quiffhead. And, um, yeah, he was a, a, you know, a British kind of uh, Elvis one of these. Number two in 1972, Alvin Stardust, Michael Kachu, previously known as Shane Fenton, uh, who had a big fan in tonight's special guest, Captain Sensible of The Damned, who will be back to continue our great conversation next. Welcome back to the evening show with Jackie Brambles, where it's just you, me, and tonight's special guest, Captain Sensible, solo artist and member of The Damned. And he is cozying on in for a great conversation and a meander through his musical memories. Uh, so, Captain, before the break, we heard about your taste for Alvin Stardust at a, at a tender age. So how about when you became um, you know, a bit older, adolescence into teenagerhood? Um, how did the musical taste change at that point? Who sort of first absolutely blew your mind and opened your eyes to music? Yeah, well, I, I liked music before uh, I heard this song that I'm going to name now. But this is the one that absolutely, you know, it shocked me. It shocked me that the power of the, um, the, the, the psychedelia, if you like, you know. It, right. It's 1967. And I was walking to school with a little transistor radio. It was a horrible sound, I, I would imagine, compared to what we're used to these days. But, um, yeah, I used to listen to the breakfast show, and I'd be, like, sort of scurrying along. I was always late. But um, this song just stopped me in my tracks. And uh, it was a CMLE play by uh, Pink Floyd. It was one of their early, early singles. Right. And uh, written by a psychedelic genius, um, Sid Barrett. Oh, OK. And uh, it's... The thing about the song, and not only is it almost the perfect pop song, um, but it's also uh, the interplay between the organ and the guitar in the middle section. There's a little instrumental break. It's just mind-blowing, you know? It's just uh, something really great about it. Uh, I, and especially at the time, I never heard anything like it before because it was all Beatles and... yeah. I, lo I love you songs and uh, Mersey Beat and all that stuff. But, S but Sid Barrett and Pink Floyd kicked all that out of the window, you know? <laughs> it's a dramatic moment. Emily tries but misunderstands. See Emily play, got to number six in 1967 for Pink Floyd and blew the mind of tonight's special guest, Captain Sensible, of the damned in a dramatic moment flip that switch in your noggin and and uh, put you on a different trajectory what about um live music did you get to see do you remember the first sort of major live gig that you went to of a band that we would know oh um yes i started going to gigs in about 69 um how old would i have been then about 14. right yeah, uh, and i so I, any gig I could get into, uh, and if I couldn't get in, if, if I was, wasn't old enough and they told me to sling me hook, I'd, I'd go in over the roof, you know, or in through the fire escape or through the kitchen. Oh, my goodness. Or, or I'd say to the roadies, could I carry something in, you know, and, and then once you're in, you kind of hide somewhere, you know, in the toilet. <laughs> the, the doors were open. So any way I could get into these gigs, I would. And uh, I, I remember I used to go and see this band a lot uh, called uh, the Groundhogs. Right. And the guitar player himself, uh, Tony McPhee, 
I mean, I used to bug him all the time and say, oh, what equipment do you use? And, you know, what's that chord shape there in that song? And I was, I used to stand in front of him you know, while he was playing. I, it must have annoyed him a bit. Um, <laughs> watch his fingers, you know, I was trying to steal, steal all his chords and stuff. That's so sweet, though, that you were such a sort of a dedicated student. <laughs> that you're standing there at the front of the stage watching his fingers. A little off-putting, perhaps, as you say, but... But it was, like you say, a musical education. Any other bands that fed into that musical education? Well, I, d I did see uh, Queen live uh, a few times and um, I was just gobsmacked at how clever... I mean, the band were obviously brilliant, but uh, yeah. also the crew were, were really good at getting Freddie his microphone. You know, he had that chopped-off microphone. Yeah. So he'd be plonking the piano one minute and the next minute he'd be the other side of the stage and just out of eye shot, the, the roadie would hand him the microphone, you know, and it was it was seamless, and you never saw this guy. Uh, but I became obsessed with like sort of, oh, look there he is with the mic, and Freddie's going, yes, yeah, sure enough, he'd grab the mic, and it was so clever because the guy was wearing all black so that he would not be noticed. And I mean, he was an astonishing front man, wasn't he? Freddie, yeah, yeah absolutely brilliant, yeah. I mean, insanely good that band were, you know. Okay, let's let's carry on then into when you sort of started getting to was what was the sort of what became the damned the first band that you were that you kind of got together with? Well, um, it wasn't actually. I was uh, I was with a, a, another punk group before that called um, the Johnny Moped Band. Right. But still going, believe it or not. Johnny, it's Johnny Moped's birthday, seventieth uh, birthday, um, in a few weeks. Happy birthday, Johnny! Yeah. He's uh, he's wonderful, um, and um, but before that, I was doing uh, weddings and stuff like that, and yeah, you know, working men's clubs with a band called um, You'll Laugh. It was called Oasis. Oh my goodness! I hope you've sued them for millions since. No, I, I, <laughs> I, I said to the band at the time, you know, uh, that you know this was like in '74 or something like that. I said, you'll never get anywhere with a crap name like I. <laughs> um, but the, the funny thing was, uh, uh, apparently, um, Noel Gallagher uh, liked the damned and um, he might have nicked his name from that. Oh, album. might have been doing his homework and thought, oh, that's a good one. Yeah, so he, he had the opposite idea from me. I, he obviously he liked, obviously liked the guy. So when did the when did the damned as as we sort of came to know it uh, come into existence then? Well, that was about seventy five. Yeah, I, I, I met the guys, and um, you know, I wanted to be in a glam rock band. Like, you know, that was the big music of the early seventies, and I thought, well, if I learn to play the guitar well enough, um, that's probably what I'll end up doing. And then I met Brian James, this uh, the, the bloke who put the damned together, this guitar player. And he was a total visionary and he played me these tunes on an acoustic guitar and it was like so radical and um you know so so wild i thought wow what was it? you know if this <laughs> if this bloke's right uh, you know it's it's going to be a total direction change for uh for music a total musical revolution if you like yeah i fancy a part of that to be quite honest so i so i jumped aboard uh, the, the good ship the damned and the, and he was right brian yeah Punk rock did explode in London in 76, 77. And the next thing you know, um, we're making records and stuff. I couldn't believe it. I, I thought that was only for the likes of, you know, Yes and Genesis. But uh, there you go. Every night I'm there, I'm always there. She knows I'm... Eloise got to number three in 1986 for The Damned. And we will be back to get into some classic happy talk with our special guest, Captain Sensible, when our great conversation continues next. Welcome back to our great conversation. Yes, every night between eight and nine, you, me, Jackie Brambles, and our special guest get into some top-notch nattering and meandering through musical memories. Tonight, we're joined by the guitarist from punk band The Damned and a solo artist, of course, in his own right, Captain Sensible. Was it very collegial in terms of that in terms of the bands that were playing in that in that brand new genre? Were you all sort of, you know, 
mixing together and helping each other out and, and chatting, or was there a bit of a competitive edge over who was going to break through first? Yes, it was it was fifty fifty. So um, yeah, everyone was putting bands together at the time. So you'd have different permutations of each, you know, each band. And uh, I, I I played with some others and Chrissy Hind famously uh, she, she played with a dan for a couple of rehearsals um and so but uh, uh, also the pistols and the clash and the stranglers and the damned and all the buscocks all the rest of them we were all like deadly rivals really yeah so um, you'd keep your play your cards close to your chest and um you'd go and watch each other's gigs and you'd criticize each other and <laughs> shout abuse and all the rest of the- <laughs> and uh yes yeah, so, but uh yeah, it was a good time though. It was, it was fairly scuzzy, and uh, nobody had any money. But uh, I'd I'd go back and live it all again. You know, given half a chance, it was it was such fun. So once success ensued for the damned, then that rite of passage, Top of the Pops, came along. I've got a list here of who was on that very first Top of the Pops with you. So it was introduced. It was on the tenth of May, nineteen seventy nine. Uh, the DJ was Mike Reed, and. Um, Obviously, it's a mixture of videos and and different things, but the people who were performing in studio with, with the Damned were Elkie Brooks. Oh, Elkie! <laughs> the Shadows with theme from the Deer Hunter. Yeah, I was standing there with you know you're standing with the guitars in the corridors waiting to go on and do your bit, and I was like, I saw Hank Marvin over the other side of the you know. That's right. So, yeah. So I started like sort of twanging. Um, down, 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 down. What was that Apache <laughs> or something? Yeah, that's right, that's right. And uh, he sidled over to me and he just gave me a very slight nudge and put something in my hand. And I looked at it, it was a five pound note. He said, Give it a rest, Captain. <laughs> 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 and did you? Did you give it a rest? Yeah, I'm, I'm anyone's for a fiver. <laughs> I love, what a brilliant story. What about, um, did you sort of get, uh, you know, put on people's tours all of a sudden because the record labels, as soon as they sort of get a whiff of a bit of success, they tend to stick you on as a supporting band onto a bigger band's tour or across to the States. What happened sort of as a result of your chart success? Oh, we got we got sent out with T-Rex, um, which was... Well, that's all right. Yeah, it, it's incredible. As a, you know, I was a glam rock fan, so to go out with... Uh, Someone like that, um, and and Mark was really nice to us. He took us on his own tour bus. So, um, I mean, there was you know you, you would expect that the, the main actors travel separate, and yeah, no, he would uh, he would give us pep talks, you know, while we're travelling up the motorway. Really? Yeah, to tell us, hey, you you know that guy in the studio, the the, the guy who tw- you know the, behind the desk who he said he's the fifth member of the band, man, you know, you've got to get him on board and, you know, keep him sweet, man, because uh, he can make or break the, the record, you know. So, uh, mm, you smart. Know, okay, Mark. And um, he said, you know, the fans, give them value, you know, give them like sort of, you know, two two tracks on a B-side. Why not, man? It's like sort of, you know, you know, give them some love. So I thought, wow, okay, Mark. Uh, yeah, so... Um, That's so nice to hear. Yeah, genuinely nice bloke. And, and how did it come about that you decided to, you know, go off and do your Captain Sensible thing by yourself? That was mainly um, damned rejects. You know, when you, when I sit down with a guitar, sometimes the song that you end up writing is uh, a million miles away from what you want. Um, so you end up with, I used to have cassettes uh, of demos, you know, sitting on the, on the shelf, yeah. unused. Loads of, like, really nice kind of, easy listening poppy kind of tunes with a bit of synthesizer on and uh, with the strength of them I, I managed to get a, a record deal with um with my I, I had a producer called Tony Mansfield who was in a band called New Music they were absolutely fantastic as well Do you remember right uh, they didn't buy- yeah yeah yes what a great hit that was and that was fairly radical at the time as well because uh, that was a that was another musical revolution where you know synthesizers became cheap enough you know and, and recording technology that you could make an album at home if you wanted to absolutely first time that had ever happened so everyone's making these great this great music and 
without you know the record company involvement in in a, a lot of cases. So um, yeah, you ended up with you know people like uh, you know M with pop music and uh, let's talk about the decision to make Captain Sensible's first solo single, Happy Talk. Not the most obvious choice, of course, a cover version of a very old show tune from the Rogers and Hammerstein musical South Pacific. Uh, something I would have thought was more up your parents' musical street than yours. Well, that was one of my f- mum and dad's favourite songs, and that oh wow, Pacific album was one of those things. And they used to play that album to me to, when I was in a cot, uh, when I was a um, you know a baby. And I just uh, I have memories of that, you know, to pacify, to shut me up, I suppose, and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I just remember that album. And uh, Tony, the producer, said, go home, Captain, and uh, find a song we'd do a cover version of, you know, something something a bit off, you know, off the beaten track, something a bit unusual. It was a fairly wacky idea, but uh, we got away with it. <laughs> awesome. I mean, were you, were you surprised at how successful it was? Oh, yeah, because, you know, it's, uh, I didn't think uh, number ones were for the likes of me, really. Um, Because I I was once described as uh, one of one of Britain's most unlikely pop stars, or something. Yes, Uh, that's a fair cop. Because I, I I haven't got the greatest voice in the world, and uh, you know, so uh, and you know, obviously, there's far more talented people than me around. But but I was in the right place at the right time with the right song. talk got to number one for captain sensible in 1982 it really does make you happy just listening to it uh, okay let's close out the hour with a track of your choosing captain uh, just for fun let's go for a change with the song that you wish you'd written song i'd wish i'd written um the never-ending story uh, which was a hit for limal oh yeah yeah it's such a lovely song and i've i've got this thing about um you know, trying to write the perfect tune. Yeah. It, it's kind of, you know, I, I, I suppose everyone who writes songs uh, as a go at that, really. But uh, the never ending story is just total perfection. And sometimes I play it at home for maybe a, an hour or two hours, or just on rot- rotation, this one song over and over and over again, at really, really loud volume. And, and my, my, my wife goes a bit crazy at me, you know. <laughs> So do you have why are you playing that same song? I'm just Will you turn your Lamal down? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, my mind is like analyzing, you know, uh, all the uh, the production and the sound and because every, every note in that song is is gold dust. Turn around, look at what you see. Never Number 4 in 1984, Lamal with Never Ending Story, our final track tonight, as chosen by our special guest, Captain Sensible, who wishes that he'd written it, and his wife wishes that he'd turn it down after playing it on repeat for a solid two hours. I just love the surprises that these great conversations bring. Captain, listen, it's been so brilliant to catch up with you, such good fun, um, and just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to, to come on the show. Cheers, Jackie. Bye. Captain Sensible, brilliantly bonkers. Great stories too for our great conversation.